Uh, but want to thank you all for today's panel on future-proofing cities and the risks that we face and opportunities to address those risks. Uh, want to say a couple quick comments on, on, on my perspectives on, on the risks that we face and some of the challenges and why getting it right in cities is so important. And we've heard the statistic talking about the fact that 50% of the world's population today lives in cities. It's going to be 70% by 2050. Uh, but some of the issues we haven't talked about, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. World Bank estimates that 70% of the world's GHG emissions come from cities. Uh, the 25 largest cities in the world are responsible for 15% of global GDP. So really the economic engines as well. And when you look at population size, political power, Sao Paulo, Tokyo, Mumbai, those cities individually are each larger than 150 UN member states. So the enormous power that cities have as well uh, is often at a, a country level. I think the World Bank uh, once referred to them as the city lights. Um, so how do they deal with the challenges that we're facing? From population growth, from climate change, where 90% of cities are on coastal areas, 300 million urban dwellers are at risk from sea level rise, from coastal storms, 15% of all global water basins in the world are water stressed, yet 50% of all cities over 100,000 people are located in those basins, so very susceptible to droughts. Uh, and thinking about um, funding, about $500 billion a year spent in the water sector alone for, urban, uh, for infrastructure, uh, about 75% of that comes from regional and local governments and the need is projected to go to a trillion dollars in the near future. So Jay spoke about this a little bit in the last panel, the enormous need for infrastructure. How do we spend that? How do we find the money for that? How do we ensure that we're spending it in flexible ways? Um, so want to frame the, the discussion that we're going to have from our panelists. Uh, the World Economic Forum every year comes out with a report on the world risks. And in 2013, their report this year had the five most impactful risks as number one, major systemic financial failure. Number two, water supply crisis. Number three, chronic fiscal imbalances. Number four, the diffusion of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And number five, the failure of climate change adaptation. And want to open the discussion and, and go through each of the panelists. Are these risks the relevant and most impactful risks for cities? What are the viable, so if not, what are the biggest risks? What are the viable solutions to addressing these risks looking over the long term? And what are the obstacles for uh, implementing those strategies? And we're going to go down and then open up uh, and have a discussion amongst the panelists. First, we're going to start with David Stevens. He's the Senior Program Advisor for the UN Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. So David. Thanks, Adam. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in, fa in fact, I was looking at the program. Um, and I'm the only one from the United Nations here, and I always joke, you know, you have the right way of doing things, the wrong way of doing things, and the UN way of doing things. So UN always brings a different perspective. I think, <laughs> I, I think it is an advantage, because many of the things that stem out from such discussions have to be implemented, and have to be implemented through partnerships and governments working together. And I think this is where the UN comes in, kicks in, and has a role to play. But at the same time, what the work we do is, is more or less focusing on making this happen. Um, when we talk about risk, at least from my office, um, we're looking at more at, at uh, natural disasters. I mean, everything else you mentioned in terms of, of risk compound the problems of c cities already face in terms of natural disasters. And, and the fact is, the statistics are quite um, appalling in terms of how um, there's an increase in vulnerability, increase in the numbers. Um, in the year 2011, which is one of the worst ones on record, we had um, 300 disasters registered, 106 million people were affected um, by flood, 60 million people by drought, 30,000 people died, and the world economy suffered a total loss of more than $350 billion. I mean, and we've had, um, in the last five years, three significant years like that. So the fact is, there has been um, an increase in the problem of risk. Um, and we are, we're looking at that. There's an increase in the frequency of natural hazards. Um, climate change um, is a reality um, in terms of, and it is um, increasing the frequency of floods. Environmental degradation is also contributing to this. Um, a growing number of uh, people living in flood prone, prone areas. Um, it's up 114% since the 1980s. So more and more people are living in vulnerable areas. 
and there's an increase of population living in the coastline exposed to cyclones, 192% um, on that as well. Okay, it does look pessimistic, and, um, and it is increasing, but I'm not, I, I, I still share some optimism in terms of what is happening um, and, and countries getting ready. I mean, um, I think uh, all of you went to Rio Plus 20, we came out with the idea that um, more should have been done. We're, we're not doing enough to reverse the trend in terms of um, environmental devastation. And the same thing is happening in terms of coping um, um, with reducing risks. But the fact is we are doing quite a lot. Um, let me focus a bit on the office, UNISDR. We are the UN office that takes care of disaster risk reduction. I mean, um, within the UN Secretariat, we have over 30 programs and offices. and quite a varied number. I myself, I've worked in three different offices, one on drugs and crime. I've even worked in one office which takes care of space. Um, I always used to joke it's the smallest office with the biggest mandate taking up space. But there's one of office which basically focuses on it and it's, it only began um, in um, 89 um, when we had the international um, framework, the international decade for natural disaster reduction. Then in 99 we had the Yokohama strategy um, and then in 99 we had the international strategy for, strategy for disaster reduction and that's the acronym of my of my office UNISDR we've changed the name but we kept the acronym and then in January 2005 we had the World Conference on Disaster Reduction which led to the Hilgo Framework of Action um, it's important because it was the first um, um, framework which actually focused on building the resilience of nations and communities of disasters remember that was just after the Indian Ocean tsunami so we had every imaginable um, um, high-level pre president, prime minister, 168 countries represented, discussing the implementation of the Hyogo Framework of Action. And we've had this Hyogo Framework of Action since 2005, and it's a 10-year action, goes to 2015, and we're right now in the process of planning the next World Conference in 2015, which will focus on the HFA2, the, um, the revision of HF2. And I'm saying this, because a lot of the ideas that come out from here will have to make its way into this HFA2, because this is the framework governments use to um, um, actually coordinate the work they, they do in the area of risk reduction. Um, some of the things, and I won't go through all of them, it's, uh, which are coming out, is the need to consider climate change um, within the new framework. Um, the, the need to focus on local governments. HFA focuses a lot on building resilience building um, government support. The fact is um, response and prevention is done at the community level, done at the city level. So this is one of the big things which HFA2 will be doing. Um, also the, uh, the need of um, gearing economic opportunities and um, the private sector involvement in terms of disaster management, um, risk reduction as well. Um, focusing on integrated approaches. Um, environmental impact assessment, considering risk reduction as well. Um, and then some um, also advances in science and technology. Um, I think we have had discussions of big data, of information management systems. Um, how can we leverage on that to um, um, support the cities? So these are some of the things that are coming up. Um, I said I'm actually, I am optimistic. I mean, in a whole, um, we do see there's an increase in um, um, number of deaths and uh, the amount, but coming down, uh, I read um, from Europe. I just flew down on the on the, on the Saturday. I, I read the USA Today, and um, it was it was talking about the tornado in Oklahoma, and the title was "How Could So Many People Survive?" And if you think about it, it was a one mile wide tornado over a 17 mile path over 56,000 a city of 56,000 people, and 28 people died. And the fact is they had a 16-minute warning. And yet, if you really think of it from that perspective, the, the, there was, the, the casualty was very low. Reason, it's, uh, the people are prepared. They react. They react to that. So they know what to do. The um, children got killed at a school, but that just goes to the fact that we need to build um, safer schools, um, resilient schools. I can give you similar examples. We had a, a big um, rainfall in March in Petropolis, which was a site of a, of a major um, um, f uh, flooding in 2011 and there was uh, a lot of people died uh, uh, I believe 28 I'm not mistaken is a number but the fact is you already saw that people reacted so people are beginning to learn the same reaction of course didn't help it didn't happen when we had the fire in Santa, um, Santa Maria down in Hugo Sioux in January where you had um, 
over 270 people killed in that. So it's a basically, it's, it's, it's this whole idea of working with communities and building the resilience. Um, Brazil as a whole is moving forward. Uh, my presence in Brazil is actually to implement a center, um, a UNISDS center to support Brazil, Portuguese speaking countries uh, and, um, and partnerships. And um, in fact, um, Brazil's got a whole normative um, framework in place. Um, impressive monitoring centers. Um, you've got Semadei and Senad already in place. Um, and I, but I would say that the mo perhaps the most it's the single most important example of Brazil's progress um, in this area of risk reduction is Belo Horizonte was awarded um, um, recently at the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction the Sasakawa Award. The Sasakawa Award is the most prestigious um, um, award any city, any organization can get which recognizes um, the work in disaster risk reduction. And Belo Horizonte received this award. Um, I could point out at least a dozen other cities in Brazil which have also been progressing quite clearly on this in terms of risk reduction. But you have 5,700 municipalities in Brazil, so the work is great. So what we're really looking at, how do you build capacity to ensure that every single city um, um, can have, um, can actually work as hard as Belo Horizonte, Campinas, Florianópolis and other cities as well. Um, we have one campaign which is actually booming in Brazil which is called the Building Resilient Cities Campaign. Um, it's basically, it's a manual. We work, uh, the city um, mayor signs off onto the campaign. Uh, he gets a certificate. And then basically there are 10 steps to follow in working through and building more resilient cities. I say this is important because more and more cities in Brazil and, um, and globally um, are, uh, are actually refocusing um, what they're doing within the cities in terms of this building resilient cities. I always say that this um, signing off is like a, a, a getting married. I mean, it's so easy to say yes, and you get married and you get a certificate, because they all get enthusiastic and say, you know, where's my certificate? I've joined the campaign. And I say, well, here's a certificate. But now comes the hard work. It's keeping the marriage going after 30, 35 years. Um, but we've had significant progress. And I see, and this is Brazil we're talking about, and other countries around the world, Philippines, Indonesia, they've all said. But going back to what I said in the beginning, it's significant progress, but are not enough to reverse the trend. We are facing compounding, compounding problems with what you mentioned. I think um, we really have to be creative in terms of finding the solutions to reverse the trend. Thank you. And next, we actually have a, a replacement in, uh, in the program, uh, yeah, um, rather than Lawrence. Could, could, could oh, I just sure. interrupt you for yep. just one thing? Can we just ask people if they can hear? Because if they yep. can't, I don't know if the earphones themselves yeah. in any language will help. Can, it, can the folks hear? One of the ideas is to grab the uh, translation headphones, and even you can tune in to English and, or Portuguese, and you'll, you'll be able to hear. So if you have problems hearing, uh, recommend just grab, grab some headphones. You can hear OK? Okay, and if great. at any point we seem like we're not responding to the right question, it's because all the speakers are pointed yeah, we, at you, we can't hear so we so. can't hear ourselves, so uh, <laughs> bear with us on that. Um, so Lawrence Jones was unable to join us, but uh, we are actually joined by Sergio Gomez, who's the Vice President for Latin America for Alstom. Um, one of the, the challenges we face, and you were mentioning climate change, is increasing temperatures, increasing demand for energy, uh, some of the challenge with how you deal with infrastructure that may be located in water areas. What are some of the challenges you see from an infrastructure standpoint uh, for cities and, and the opportunities to move forward? Thank you, Alan. In fact, uh, when we talk about resilience and be ready for the future, uh, what the cities will need is for sure electricity. I think that uh, everybody already, uh, already uh, were in a city or in a situation that uh, there, were, there was no electricity. Nowadays, electricity is more and more uh, the energy that is moving the things ahead. And in a city, it's essential not only for communications among all the, the devices that the city needs, but also for the basic services, huh? water, uh, fire extinguishers, and everything. So in fact, uh, when we talk about energy and electricity, uh, what we can do for the future is to provide the cities with most reliable and uh, sustainable uh, electricity uh, attendance. So from this perspective that we have also to combine uh, the, the environment, the climate and the, the, 
the reduction of uh, the, the CO2 emissions, what the, the, the electricity sector can do for the infrastructure is, for example, to develop infrastructures to bring energy or electricity from a, a, a more environmental friendly uh, uh, source, like, for example, an hydro power plant, that the old, old kind of uh, energy generation has some environmental impact but uh, some has uh, less than others. So for example, like uh, we are doing here in Brazil, we are bringing energy from the very north, hydropower plants located in the, in the rivers in the Amazon region to the downtown, uh, to the, the, the center part of the country or the southern part of the country like Sao Paulo city in a very, very efficient way. For example, using the, the super grid technology of uh, high voltage direct current. So this is the support of the infrastructure that we can provide to the cities, okay, from their point of view. Other, other, other kind of uh, support that we can provide from the electricity point of view is to provide the cities with uh, the management systems of uh, distribution of the electricity that can r uh, recover from an outage. I'm not talking here about a natural disaster. For natural disasters, we have other, m other ways to, to support the cities or the, 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 the industry involved in the electricity uh, has another ways, like uh, with mobile substations and emergency uh, energy electricity uh, source. But I'm talking here of a not a natural disaster, like an outage in the city. As soon as you recover the system from an outage, as less as impact you have in the city. As less as people you have uh, stopped at the, the metro platform waiting for the train, as less as you have uh, uh, a hospital so without electricity to make surgeries. So it's a key to feed the cities with a very reliable and a very high quality energy electricity system. So in this field also, what we can contribute is to provide systems that can even anticipate some outages. So what we have in been developing are tools that can predict, due to the network stability or network, uh, some data from the network, they can collect and even predict some outages. So then you can anticipate and maneuver your network in the way that you avoid big loads to be disconnected. This is uh, also other part and also now coming for more complex uh, city management systems, let's say, that integrates everything, all the devices in the city, like uh, traffic lights, like uh, uh, fire uh, uh, actions and the things like that, what we can do is to combine our energy management systems with the, these other systems in order to provide it to the, to the city managers, you see, conditions to, to, to monitor and to, to, uh, to disconnect part of the network to not feed another, another problem, to not increase a problem that is occurring in the city. Uh, what we have to do also for the future is to guarantee that uh, the electricity or the energy will be available. You know that from now till the year 2030, the, the demand for energy will increase by 80%. So what we have to do is to provide that most of that demand will be concentrated in the cities. So what we can do is to, what we have to do, what we must do, is to provide a reliable, a secure, and the most clean as possible energy and electricity to feed all these developments. Okay, so uh, from this uh, this uh, aspect, what we can also contribute is, for example, to manage and to integrate a lot of uh, uh, small power plants. Uh, even because now we our, our behavior as uh, as uh, electricity consumer will change. We will be no longer only consumer. It will be also producers in our house. We will have on the roof uh, in some countries and some cities, this is already a significant part of the energy producing. So we'll be uh, pro-consumers because we'll be at the same time consumer and we'll be producing energy. So what we can do is to provide uh, with the, the city with a very, very smart management system to integrate and to minimize all the, all the source, to minimize the losses of all these different source to provide that city and the citizens with the most efficient and cheap uh, electricity because electricity will increase for sure uh, in our expense bill forever because we will improve, improve, improve our, our consumer of energy of electricity. So what we can do is managing this different source, combine the most efficient and most cheapest one to provide with a very, very uh, reliable and cheap electricity. So I think that this is the contribution we can do for the future of the city.
Thank you. So we're next joined by uh, Pedro Jacobi, who's the president of ICLE Brazil. ICLE has uh, really been on the forefront of promoting resilient cities, resilient communities. They are officially recognized by the UN to speak for local governments at the uh, United Nations Conference on Parties. Um, Want to talk about what, where do you see the risks, and in, in, are cities recognized and empowered enough by the national and international bodies to actually address the risks that they face? Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, basically, what uh, we can see is that um, most of the city are not really well uh, empowered. Um, ICLE um, is an international organization, an NGO, which has as one of its main goals the connection and the articulation between <laughs> between uh, municipalities and mainly uh, the issues that are being um, submitted to these cities, to present it to these cities, are related to uh, aspects that are at its very beginning in most developing countries. Dealing with energy efficient cities, dealing with resilient cities, dealing with issues that are linked to the preservation of biodiversity, we are talking of several aspects that uh, not only ICLE, but I mean in terms of speaking about uh, general cities, that we have a se several constraining aspects that have to be considered when we talk about how to increase capacity building, how to improve social capital, basically because we are dealing with some factors, as I mentioned, that are constraining. We cannot avoid the fact that a large part of our population has a very fragile education and understanding of the issues that are linked to uh, what could be called something that uh, expands besides their daily lives. So, uh, for example, when we look at many uh, countries around the world and the larger cities that are affected by these climate climatic variabilities and mainly by extreme events, what we see is it's always, although the tragedy is announced, the solution is always taking place after the tragedy. And this is mainly because uh, the cities are really not well prepared. The lack of capacity building the lack of preparedness of the public officials, of the people who have to deal with the issues of poverty are in many cases so patrimoni patrimonialistic, so clientelistic, that when it comes to something that has to be seen and thought as being more preventive, things become very fragile in terms of its implementation. We cannot uh, disconsider the fact of the social inequalities, as I mentioned before. And besides that, we have to consider that these social asymmetries and these dual cities in which we live demand more and more that we invest essentially in issues linked to information, knowledge, capacity building, and in practices of social learning. Because it's not easy to deal with the fragility of the social context in which we live. And many times, because we are middle class and because we are well educated, we just disconsider the fact that these social inequalities cannot be treated on a logic of tutelage. They have to be treated on a more dialogical process. And this implies, basically, as I mentioned before, in the need that cities to be more resilient, cities to be more uh, capable to confront uh, the problems that we know that can be 
stronger or weaker because this is something imprecise. Uncertainty is something which we deal with. And if we don't want to be only on a catastrophic logic, but we want to be on a preventive logic and on a, and on a perspective that deals with education, that deals with dialogues, that deals with the construction of bodies where citizens can be more and more prepared to deal with the things that they are not uh, able to cope. And basically, it's that. Many times you watch on TV the cases of people, oh, I will, I will not leave my home because I don't have any other place to go. That's something very common when we see this on the media. And what is the solution? The people losing their lives or the poor people being prevented? The fact is that in many, many of our cities, unfortunately, the preventive issues have been very fragile. And when this uh, affects, when these processes, these extreme events that have been multiplying happens, everybody is solidary, everybody helps. But when it comes to prevent, things are very fragile. And I think this is one of the most important issues that we have to strengthen in local governments, that we have to strengthen in the dialogues between the business community and local governments, and we have to strengthen between the universities and all those who are into capacity building. Thank you very much. Next, we're joined by Juan Carlos Castilla Rubio, the CEO of the Planetary Skin Institute. And Sergio mentioned the fact that the role of data in the energy sector in trying to uh, predict and, and prevent damages before they occur. You know, what are the biggest risks that you see facing cities, and what's the role of data uh, to help mitigate those risks? Uh, thanks. C can you hear back there? More or less. Okay. Um, yes, our, our colleague from Eclay just mentioned the uh, the the huge elephant in the room, really, which is that um, there isn't enough end-to-end -end capacity building information, capabilities, not only capacity, but also capabilities to deal with the new risk normal that we are unfortunately facing today around the world uh, in developed economies and, uh, and in the emerging markets in the developing world. And uh, uh, if I reflect back to answer your, your comment, uh, Adrian, or your question, with respect to the, the, uh, the big risks that the WEF reports on an annual basis, uh, I, of course, have to agree with that ranking because I was part of the team that put that report together. <laughs> but the most important thing is not the individual risks, but how they're actually connected in this hyper-connected world of ours where um, something happens in uh, Thailand and the effects are catastrophic in Sao Paulo. Um, now, to give you a sense of the type of interconnectedness of the, f of the type of risks that, uh, that Adrian mentioned, so first and foremost, I think a very important trigger is the, uh, the genie that has gone out of the bottle and it's very likely that the genie won't be able to be put, be put back into the bottle. And what I'm talking about is the increasing um, frequency and impact of weather extremes, which is climate-induced. Now, of course, that's the trigger. But in addition and separately, independently, humans, particularly in cities and to the south and to the east of the world, take very poor land use decisions because of lack of information amongst, amongst several other issues. And thus, the chaotic urbanization processes in the favelas of the world uh, create a huge increase, measurable increase and huge increase in the vulnerability and the exposure. And if you add the two independent effects, which are part of our new risk normal, huge increase in weather extremes around the world, plus very poor uh, land use based decisions, which increases significantly the vulnerability and the exposure, you get an explosive mixture. And the way that we experiment it is uh, through, in, 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 from our point of view, 
using the, the wrong term of natural disasters uh, in one dimension. And, and I say wrong because they're very unnatural disasters. They're very human-induced. The trigger, of course, is weather extremes, climate-induced. But the poor land use decisions is human decisions that they could heavily be improved if there were the right decision support platforms to address those issues. And so, of course, these huge increase of uh, unnatural disasters around the world um, not, only, not only creates huge loss of life around the world, but also impacts the economies heavily in, in terms of loss of infrastructure, loss of assets, and in the emerging markets and in a country like Brazil, or Brazil type, like uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, old colleague of mine from Peru, I'm Peruvian, uh, commodity-based economies that highly depend on, by the way, the weather, agriculture, mining, energy, water, um, uh, all, resource, all resources that come from the rural side that are, of course, consumed in the urban world are heavily impacted by those weather extremes. And because those, that cost, the cost for disaster recovery, whether it's loss of assets, infrastructure, lives, or, or, or commodities to sell at the right time, at the right price, for the right client, this, of course, accelerates, accelerates and, and makes it more difficult to arrive to a fiscal balance. To give you a sense of why that, you know, weather extremes, climate change, related to poor, um, uh, poor uh, land use based decisions, creates unnatural disasters, impacting the economy, loss of lives, that then, in a country like Brazil, or many countries like Brazil, the direct cost of disaster recovery has uh, skyrocketed. In countries like this one, or countries similar to this one, in the last five or six years, the, 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 the direct cost of recovery, in many cases, have increased between 50 to 100 times in the last five years. Now, if any government official or any corporate guy looks at those numbers, uh, it, it becomes a non-brainer to prevent to your point. And so there is no real business planning needed or policy, big complex policy that is required. It's just a simple notion that prevention is cost effective. And, and so to, back to your point now on data. Um, yeah, uh, data has value, but much more important is knowledge to act. And much more sophisticated than data is knowledge to act. And so um, this country, for example, but also other countries around the world, particularly in the emerging markets in the developing world, uh, if I go back two years, two years back in history, and look at the whole developing world and the emerging markets as a whole, when you ask the question, which of those countries have multi-hazard, comprehensive, national monitoring and early warning systems? in the emerging markets in the developing world, the answer would be close to zero. At the, point in, at the point in history in which countries need it the most. Of course, the exception is the tsunami-based early warning systems that, are, that have been deployed in the Pacific for, for good reasons. And so it had to be a, a, a woman leader. I believe, actually, women will solve this problem, not men. Um, it had to be a woman in this country to take the opportunity of a big problem, which was landslide, killing 1,200 people in Rio, to in, in silent mode, in silent mode, create a, um, uh, a 20 institutional uh, uh, strong task force to create in less than nine months a national, national monitoring and early warning system for natural disasters in Brazil. The country I'm talking about is Brazil, and the lady that I'm talking about is the, the president of Brazil, who took a personal role in leadership uh, because, of course, a country so sophisticated as Brazil technologically, scientifically, lacking a national monitoring and early warning system, knowing that there are millions of people at risk, and knowing that the weather extremes are impacting all, all around the territory, 
uh, is, is kind of a non-brainer thing to do. But the important thing to rescue is that you can't manage if you can't measure the risks. It's just a simple thing as that. If you don't, can't measure the risks, understand the risks, characterize the risks, and plan for mitigation, there is no way that you can manage those risks and drive for resiliency, which, which then takes me to my final point, which is a lot of the issues in the south of, of the world are issues that the south needs to solve for itself because no one will solve it for them, for people in the south and the east of the world, I mean. And so the, the, um, there is a growing coalition uh, of um, Brazil-type countries in the developing world where replicating and scaling early warning systems to provide the information uh, necessary for, for public risk management and then for private risk management uh, in order to understand the risks and build resilience and, and, and carry out the investments in infrastructure, for example, that are required not to have a situation where the costs are completely uncapped, contributing more and more to a situation of fiscal instability, which of course naturally translates to our, our friend Jay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, and then last we have Jay Collins, who's the global head of public sector group at Citi. Um, and Jay, we, we've talked a little about, uh, David mentioned it's $350 billion lost in uh, economic impacts as a result of natural disasters. Uh, Juan Carlos just spoke about you know, what happens in uh, other countries, ripples through the global economy. But particularly with climate change and, and the risk facing cities as an economic engine and source of innovation and uh, growth, you know, is that a, a challenge not just for cities but for the world? And, and what are some of the strategies to mitigate that risk? I have an excuse not to answer the question because I couldn't hear it. <laughs> I'll, I'll share it with but you. I, so I, it's funny because in the last presentation, someone said, do you realize you said a trillion when you meant a billion? And I said, look, I just got off a plane from New York. Give me a break. I can't hear myself think up here. <laughs> so excuse me if I get my, my numbers wrong. But let, me, let me say absolutely, I think natural disaster risk is the risk of of urbanization as we go forward. And again, to put the numbers in context, um, and I'll try and speak closer to the, to the microphone. G is that better? Okay. Um, so, uh, s 7 billion people in the world, 2.6 billion of them live in urban centers. Um, and 890 million of them, so think about a third, live in urban centers with one major natural disaster risk, at least one major natural disaster risk. So to put that in the context of numbers of cities, think 450 uh, cities around the world with over a million people in them of which 60% of those are subject to at least one major natural disaster risk. So the concentration risk, when you think of how concentrated the world's population is in urban centers, um, not to mention if you do the math of 10% megacities, 600 cities with that are, that are in coastal areas with floods, you get highly concentrated risk of dense population, which creates not only human but economic impact in large coastal cities, okay? Um, so how we prepare for, and the comments here were, were critical of, of the preparation for natural disasters. These cities are serial natural disaster victims. These aren't once in a while events, we're now in a world with what's happening with the environment and with the concentration in cities where you should prepare because it hits you and then like in the Philippines, Manila, all of the Philippines, 22 times a year, you're gonna get hit. So get ready. And you get into this um, disaster fatigue almost of governments to where they're just responding to the last one and can barely muster the resources to get ready for the next one. 
that's the environment we live in and the, and, and the challenges we're facing. Now, I'd like to build on three, three quick areas where we at City have seen um, and think there's great need for improvement. One is in this infrastructure space, you triggered an idea that I, uh, that I um, spoke about about a month ago on not just land use, but building, uh, building maintenance, land and, and building sustainability in major urban centers. So cities around the world have standards that they um, have either regulated or, or put into law to maintain um, buildings and infrastructure to a certain standard. By and large, developed and undeveloped countries in the world do not implement those standards, okay? Um, so what you see in Bangladesh, you have the potential for that in urban centers all over the world because those standards are not maintained. Now, the banking system, interesting, about a decade ago in the environmental space saw that there was a need to raise the bar for environmental standards. And the banking system announced what was called the equator principles, a principles to say there is a certain minimum threshold of environmental standards without which we will not finance you, okay? Now we have the need in the natural disaster space now to do the same thing. So what the global banking community ought to be doing is implementing natural disaster prevention principles. Um, I call them DPPs, Disaster Pre Prevention Principles. What that means is we should, we should make mandatory as we finance in project financing any infrastructure in a city that the cer certain levels of thresholds of standards for sustainability are maintained. And the bank can through what we call covenants, meaning rules that have to be met to maintain your credit with your, the loans um, ex, uh, status with the banks, you have to maintain those standards going forward. If we don't do that, to re continue to rely on something that is failing and has failed recently and continues to fail, which is government's inability to implement these standards, we won't get there. And we will see this economic damage as well as human suffering increase exponentially going forward. Second point, um, cities are living in the financial sphere in a paper and cash world. So imagine a world where, yes, it's inefficient if you're paying people with cash. Yes, it's inefficient if you're not in an electronic banking world and you have to sign forms to make payments. But imagine that in a disaster. Your operational sustainability shuts down completely. Um, you no longer, as a government, have the ability to respond to a crisis. So those days have to end. Governments have to move to an electronic banking world. Think two things. Think payment of the, the government's ability to procure during a natural disaster. Think um, hospitals, uh, first responders. Um, think that the, the EMT teams that go out, the, uh, the buses, the waste removal trucks. If what has to happen for those people to get paid a week, a month, two months after the disaster is to rely on either their goodwill or to try and find the matching signature card that authorizes the piece of paper to get them paid that was burnt in City Hall or is it, uh, that's under the city's seven feet of water, that won't happen. So the world of, of modern technology and banking is we give you procurement cards. We give you the ability to use cards and an electronic ability to make those payments despite the natural disaster. Last example of that is governments make benefit payments all the time to the poorest of their population. Well, you try doing that in cash in the middle of a natural disaster. Again, it doesn't happen. If you drew a Venn diagram around the poorest people of a city, and you then draw another circle around those that, are that receive and depend on benefit payments, 
and you draw another circle around those that are hardest hit by the natural disaster, they're concentric circles. Those are the, th those are the same people. So if you're trying to figure out how to hand out cash in the middle of a crisis to get to those people without having used the latest capability of the financial system, which are prepaid cards. At some point it will be mobile finance technology, but right now it's prepaid cards to be able to distribute that money in a way that you can track, that you have control, that you have transparency, you have audit. You're not sending out cash, giving it to the same person over and over. Um, you actually know what you're doing and you have some type of impact analysis you can put around it. That's what we should be doing. And so many cities around the world are still failing to implement these very basic principles that, again, these are, these are things that we think together and we've worked hard with the United Nations and others to try and help uh, educate um, uh, governments and citizens around the world with these, these ideas. So, you know, what, what I heard from the, the panelists and the, the risks facing cities, climate change, probably the number one from everyone, land use decisions and an unwillingness to enforce standards and codes, uh, a lack of the recognition of risk, uh, and capacity to prepare, plan, and, and I'll add, respond to risks within the government, uh, looking at the, the risks facing cities in an uncertain future. You know, I, I want to turn, Pedro and Juan Carlos both mentioned the, the lack of recognition of risk. Uh, in the United States, we deal a lot with the one in a hundred year flood, which is the basis of our building codes, the basis of our flood insurance program. Uh, and it does not mean that once you get that one in a hundred year flood, you're now good for 99 years. It means in any given year, there's a 1% chance that a certain flood of a certain height will occur. And if you put it in terms of a mortgage, it means within a 30 year period, there's probably a one in three chance that this type of flood event will happen. I think a lot of people may make different decisions on where they invest their money if they change the way they think about that. So Juan Carlos, I want to ask you, is the greater challenge in, in chicken before the egg, is it the lack of public recognition and understanding of risks or lack of political willingness to address those risks and lead among them? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a chicken and egg situation. And, and I think just, if you could speak in. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Speak closer. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a chicken and egg situation, um, pretty much, uh, because um, the, the, the recognition only comes when it is experimented to a large extent. Whether it's uh, ex post recognition, given l lots of unnecessary loss of life or assets or infrastructure, and then, of course, I have to do something about it in prevention and and understanding, characterizing risk in order to mitigate those risks uh, is kind of the second step. But uh, I think you can square that, that, that triangle uh, and remove the circularity by doing both in parallel. There is nothing that is in front of doing both in parallel, which is, uh, and of course I come from a Silicon Valley background, which is things can be built very quickly uh, in three month cycles, you can develop a lot of things in three months. Uh, and so um, the best way to, for example, get leaders to lead is not to show them PowerPoints or Word documents or even have conversations and, and talk and talk and talk. The best way to get a leader to lead is to show a working prototype that is actually real that is not the full thing, but it's something that, that, that allows the, the person, the leader to experiment and to understand, oh, and what if I had this and this and this? And what if now I can understand the risk and plan better? Oh, I have to really understand how the exposure and the vulnerability of my cities, I need to know that every six months because I need to completely rethink about public policy and investments and how to deal with infrastructure. So I think there is a way, there is a way to uh, not be stuck in the vicious circle. Yeah, no, so Dave, do you want to answer? And I, and I would say, based on that, and you were the optimist in the group. So I in response to that also, uh, are there good examples to look at where cities are doing this well? Um, no, I just wanted to, to, to come in with two points. One, 
when we talk about the lack of recognition of risk, I'm thinking further in terms of we really don't know. We have to re re reassess what risk means in terms of climate change, in terms of increased vulnerability, in terms of complex emergencies. So that's one thing. So even though we might think we know risk, we don't know. But I, I wanted to have more of a concrete example as a Brazilian. I mean, um, as a Brazilian, we all have car insurance. I don't think there's anybody here in Brazil who owns a car who doesn't have car insurance. But invariably, you won't have an insurance of your home. You don't insure your house unless it's against robbery. But you never think of insuring your house against a flood, a landslide, or nothing. So it's interesting. We in Brazil perceive risk of losing our car, but we don't perceive risk about losing our home. It's interesting. So we don't, in Brazil, have a, a, a clear notion of risk ourselves, of, of risk our property have, like the Americans have. I mean, in America, first thing you do, where's my 100-year flood-prone area, and um, how much is my risk going to be? If, if um, so I, I, I am maybe one of the few. Yes, thank you. So I, I'm not Brazilian, but I live in Brazil because I'm married to a beautiful Brazilian, as I have mentioned to you. Um, that's why I live in Brazil. Uh, and I, I tried to get uh, flood insurance for my home because, of course, I, I, I have inside information about flood zones and probabilities. Uh, but uh, insurance companies are not prepared. They lack the information to characterize and price risk. And so my comment on, on um, simplistically speaking, the ability of early warning systems for public risk management e equally applies for private risk management. And so insurance companies either uh, say, no, it's uninsurable, or they put the policy right up because they want to, they, they overestimate the risk and therefore uh, price themselves out of the market. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, you can. Okay. No, no. The, 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 the other quick thing this on the one, one to 100 point, uh, one, one in the return curve, one in 100 years, you know, that's a statistic. And dealing with uncertainty is not the natural domain of the layman, however well educated that layman may be. And so I don't know if you know this, but the Amazon jungle, the Amazon basin here in, here in, in South America, has experimented four weather extremes, two, one in 500 years flood events, sorry, drought events, and two, one in 200 year drought events in the last seven years. I don't know if mathematically that makes sense to you, <laughs> that the probabilities were so low and yet four of them repeated in the last seven years. Actually what that means is that the Amazon basin is oscillating, and by simple ecology, that is the proxy for massive disruptive change is on its way. Uh, uh, so we haven't talked about disruptive change, we've just talked about kind of evolutionary uh, risk, but that is a completely another ball game. I'll stop there. Uh, I want to stress an aspect about insurance because I think we have to consider that given the social inequalities and asymmetries in countries like Brazil and others, most of the people do not have the resources to make any kind of insurance, and also even in their cars. No? So we have to be very realistic about what it implies when you're talking about this, and those who have, and those who doesn't have. And uh, continuing on your arguments, I think that it's important to strengthen how what are the codes to be able to talk with people that are more and more um, affected by vulnerability? Because to use the word vulnerability, resilience, all the magic words of our times brings us to something that is important that is to explain to people that their, no, their lives, as you mentioned before, that were, until some time ago, normal, are not anymore normal. Because these phenomena, and I don't want to here put it catastrophically, but the indicators of IPCC, if we are not uh, skeptic, skeptical about it, indicate 
that the changes are taking place in diff at different levels. And what you mentioned about the Amazon is something really absolutely uh, important to be stressed. No? So uh, I want to, again, to speak more about, uh, present at least the issues of what it implies to do capacity building. How little we are prepared to do capacity building, because maybe we did always capacity building as business as usual. We can be doing it very well with the good educated, with MBAs, et cetera, et cetera. But we are doing it very fragile with the vulnerable. And this means that we have to uh, try to think the questions that are different according to the areas of the planet. Say, as you mentioned, the case of Southeast Asia, which is accustomed to typhoons or the areas of the Middle West that are accustomed to tornadoes, but still they live there. And in our cities, to what are we accustomed? No? To bring up the issue that we don't have the typical characteristics of those phenomena, climatic phenomena. But th as they are multiplying, we have to be more and more aware of the way to communicate with people and to work with an educational basis to bring up the fact that people have to be more and more involved within the logic of prevention. And that obviously implies in terms of the role of public, uh, of public officials and local government, which are basically not to prepare to, for it. So we're, we're going to move to questions from the public. Uh, I'm just going to ask Jay one question. So please start thinking about what your, uh, your question for the panelists may be. Jay, in, in the last Carbon Disclosure Project report on cities, they found that 64% of climate actions in cities are funded through municipal budgets, that only 14% were from uh, the private sector, less than 1% by development banks. And you've seen this in the U.S. with energy efficiency. The federal government has done some work on energy efficiency, community development block grants, and other things to drive PACE programs, other energy efficiency efforts. But the commercial sector has been slower to engage in that. You know, is the private sector engaging in sustainability, particularly risk reduction strategies in cities? And if not, what is missing to help them get engaged? Um, so l let me let me say I think. Um, do you want me to? Um, f first, I've sa I'd say in a constrained, you want to turn it up a little? Otherwise, I have to kiss it. Okay. Um, so the, in, in a constrained resource environment, in a constrained investment environment, putting the resources um, into s sustainable development, into the environment, um, has, has been a, a slow-moving process. Um, I think one of the things we, we're seeing is, is twofold, is, is that in the, in, in the renewable space in cities, we've had to have government subsidies. We've had to have some government intervention to facilitate, incentivize the, the right behavior. Um, if you look, though, at what happens over time in the, with the economies of scale, and technology. Just take solar, for example. You know, the, the cost of solar is dropping at such an extraordinary rate um, that it is transformational. Um, and so what we see in terms of you know, the, you know, the, the, the typical cycle of how long it really takes to get to um, a, a, essentially a, either a, from the investor's perspective a return on investment or a, a payback period, um, the, the break-even points of renewable energy are, dr are dropping, and they're dropping rapidly. That's the good news with time, is, is with time that will um, continue to adjust. But that you still require, as you said, the, the percentages of the investment are so low compared to what needs to be done. You still need the appropriate regulatory and um, incentive process to get the private sector in and investing. Now, you can, just like we were talking about with land use, um, like we've talked about with 
environmental principles, banks can do the right thing. I mean, you can, you can have, we've, city has adopted now several years ago, um, minimum investment standards in terms of our own uh, s support for any renewable project for any client in the world. Um, but more importantly, we said the buck stops here at home. We want to behave in a certain, if we don't behave this way ourselves and our facilities, our premises aren't um, up to a high environmental standard, we can't expect our clients to be there as well. So um, yes, governments need to do the right thing, but there is particularly with, you know, less the SME world, but the large corporates, is there's just certain behavior standards that we should expect um, in the urban world going forward. So I want to open, why don't we take two questions in succession uh, in the interest of time, and then we'll let the panel respond if, if there are folks who have questions. If you want to raise your hand, we can bring a microphone to you. And is there someone else who would like to ask on the piggyback onto that as well? Or we can close with one. All right, so we'll go one, two, and then we'll give the panel some time to respond. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Victoria. I want to know uh, what do you think about, uh, for example, Belmont in Amazonia? Can you speak up? Yeah. Uh, if, if you could speak up, please, we couldn't hear the question. <laughs> Uh, I want to know uh, what do you think about, for example, Belo Monte in Amazonia? Belo Monte. Maybe. Uh, okay. Okay. And now you know we'll go to the gentleman in front as well. Um, I'm a little concerned about. Uh, we are here talking about the problems in cities in general, even though most of the, the discussion was about Brazil and uh, this, this area. But we, we understand the, the problems and the, the uh, impact of electricity in, in the life of a community, in the cities, and, and the need of electricity. We are in the 21st century, uh, internet, uh, computers, but in Africa, less than 20% of the population of the continent have access to electricity 24 hours per day. They are trying very hard to provide electricity to the population. If they do it using the same matrix that we used in, in, the, in the Western uh, continents, this world won't be able to sustain itself for, for another 30 years. They don't have the funds and the, the, the uh, means to provide electricity to their population using uh, new and uh, alternative sources. They cannot finance it. How do you see this the situation? Because we may do very well here, but if they if we they don't solve the problem on the other side, the planet is in, at risk at the same the same way. I mean, it, we still have the same problem to to deal with. So I, f I understand that uh, the solidarity uh, will require not only goodwill but investment to, to assist them. But I would like to, to get and, the and impression of, and of the just we'll, we'll take the gentleman in front of you as well. So we get three questions and then we'll, we'll go to the panel. Okay. You, you made a, a question in terms of uh, asking uh, in terms how can the private sector support, no? And it's not just around financing. I believe it's also a lot to do with sharing best practices and certainly the private sector each is much more ahead in terms of resilience. So I don't know if anybody of the forum ca can share, for example, we have seen a digitalization. So many things that are still done through paper, you have to transform that and, and, and digitalize all that information, either making payments or that. So I don't know if the forum could share experiences what the pri private sector has done well that could be shared to the, to the public sure. sector. No? So, so the three questions is, I think I heard them. Uh, what are the examples of how the private sector can help in terms of sharing best practices and driving innovation? Um, what about development issues in Africa? 
Uh, how do we help with electrification and some of the real infrastructure risks that they face on, on a very basic level? And then about a, a particular power plant, the Belmont Power Plant in Brazil, if folks had a, an opinion on that issue. So I'll, I'll open it to folks on the panel who, who would like to choose to respond to uh, any of the three. I guess I can take the electricity part of the questions, let's see. Do you hear me? No? Uh, try, try now. No, uh, the part of it. <laughs> so, uh, the first question related to Belo Monte Hydro Power Plant, I think that the concern is, uh, is regarding the environmental impact of that uh, project being built in the Amazon region. Eh? We will not make any judgment about that. It's, a, let's say, a country energy matrix decision. So, it was a decision that the Brazil took, the government of Brazil took to develop such kind of source. If we see in Brazil, uh, almost all the resource, natural resource for electricity, natural resource, I mean hydropower plants. So we can consider waste, for example, it's a natural resource or, or nowadays because it's produced naturally by everybody of us. But uh, thinking on the on the hydropower plants in Brazil, hydro, it's uh, the base uh, in the matrix, it's the biggest part of the energy matrix in Brazil. So the government decides to implement that. And uh, if we see now, most of uh, the, 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 the possibilities, the potential in the south southeast region, it's already explored. So the only region that still has some possibilities is in the Amazon region. And this is why the government decided to support such projects like uh, Rio Xingu projects, Rio Madeira projects, and others. So of course, there is, as I said, there is no energy source that will not impact the environment. The problem is to decide uh, what kind of uh, of impact that you, you assume as a benefit to the risk of not having electricity enough to your population. Eh? Those plants, uh, the Amazon uh, plants, they are built now with a different technology. In generation, they are using bulb generators. Bulb generators demands uh, works more with the flow of the water and not with the height of the dam. So they demand a much lower lake there will be always an impact. There is no way to build an hydropower plant without the impact. What we are seeing in Belmonte, it's uh, a lot of other issues related to Indian population and other issues, you see. I'm not uh, here to judge if it's uh, good or not to Brazil, but the Brazil needs to do it. So for the African, uh, what we can say is more or less Brazil universalized it some time ago, the energy, the electricity. Huh? Uh, I cannot say 100% of the Brazilians has access to this, to the to the, the electricity, but I can assure that most Brazilian has access to the city, to the electricity, than the Swiss people. So this is really amazing. I don't know if it was a good decision, but it was done and it was implemented. In Africa, what we are seeing is that uh, almost uh, all the countries will share their resources. Like in Europe, that now energy, electricity will flow from one country to the other, and thanks to the technology of uh, high voltage, uh, direct current, and other technologies, and also the management system of the networks we can provide and flow the energy from one side of Europe, from Russia to Spain or to Portugal, in Africa we do the same. So I think that what will help uh, in the solidarity, let's say, on the countries, is to produce energy in countries that has a lot of resource and transmit and distribute that to the other countries that does not have. This will make the less impact of the environment as well as make the access to the electricity a little bit cheaper than if each country should work isolated from the others, keeping their own network isolated from the others. I think that sharing, cross border, uh, going across the borders will be the solution for Africa, like it will be more also here in Latin America. Right. So, so as you'll hear, we are, we are out of time. I'll give Jay a last moment for, for a quick comment. Uh, and then uh, just want to thank all of our panelists and for the audience for, uh, for being with us today. So, Jay, you get the closing comment. Great. Just, uh, just to answer the question in terms of uh, best practice and what we're seeing, two things. One is we are seeing tremendous public-private cooperation. So, you know, if you, if you look at what um, Target has done with FEMA in the United States, um, the work of Swiss Re, um, Another example, the, the work uh, that, that is happening between the International Red Cross um, and FedEx, um, Pfizer's work with UNICEF, 
um, our work with the World Food Program. There are tons of examples where, where large companies with global responsibilities are partnering in this space to respond to natural disasters and to rise to the occasion. Um, and the sharing of best practice with the corporate space to the government space is also very helpful. So what we call continuity of business preparation, right, COB. Um, that has been perfected, I shouldn't say perfected, but it's been advanced um, re really since the Asia tsunami crisis. And now you're seeing continuity of business practices in the private sector space get pushed into the public sector space in a way that works. And finally, to your comment on, on you know, Africa and what's happening there, I, I think there, there are enormous innovations going on. And I think just I'd give you one example. There's a company called Powerhive. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's taking the advancement in Kenya of mobile money which allows for mobile payments and the poorest of the population that has the mobile phone to connect to the lower cost of solar. And literally, they will show up in a village with what, what you can imagine, power hive. It's a solar grill, transportable, small, that the villagers of the entire village can come and plug into. Individualized payments, they pay from their cell, from their mobile money account. If they don't pay, their power, their plug is shut off. Um, this power hive is self-sustainable, no government support, high enough IRRs for the, high enough returns for the private sector to do it, and um, extremely innovative, taking advantage of technology advancement, renew renewable energy advancement, and financial service advancement to get to the neediest um, people who, who don't have energy. So uh, why don't we, we end there with somewhat of an optimistic story that innovation is, is meeting to some of the risks, uh, obviously enormous challenges that we face. So I encourage you, please find the panelists through the rest of the session later today to continue the discussion and thank you all for your participation.